بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الفهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين الحمد لله بيف توفيق to resume our study of the valuable book تعليم وتربيت در الإسلام or training and education Islam by the late Ayatollah Mutakhari Rizwanullah Ta'ala Alayhi as you know, our last topic has been ethical relativism. And we had already had two sessions before Muharram started. And since it was very important for us to know more about this, we expanded and I shared with you uh, some of the points that I had discussed with uh, uh, about this topic in my thesis. So, Ayatollah Mutahari Radwanullah Ta'ala Alai uh, continues this discussion about ethical relativism and some of the most important points that he makes in these uh, lectures on ethical relativism because he has uh, in lecture eight discussion about ethical relativism and lecture nine of the book. Remember the book is based on two series of lectures. So in the first series of lectures that we have been studying, lecture eight is on ethical relativism and lecture nine again. Uh, so we have talked about some of it, but some of the most important points that he mentions is that you have to make distinction between akhlaq, morality, as qualities and as actions. We have moral characteristics, moral traits of character, moral qualities, and we have moral actions. For example, something that he mentions is about effa, chastity. Some people think chastity is only for women, for example. And they say, you know, in the past, women didn't have to come out of the house that much. Uh, at least they didn't need to go and work, for example. If they went outside, was you know, maybe just for visiting, etc. And they say when modern societies took four, you know, then women had to work, they had to go to factories, to offices, to you know, keep shops, etc. And they say now they cannot be observing chastity like before. Now they need to interact with the opposite gender, etc. So they want to say chastity is a relative issue. If in the past someone was doing certain things that some women do today, it was against chastity, but today it's not against chastity. Hope we have lots of discussions about this. First of all, chastity is not only for women, but the main discussion that we have about this today is that chastity as a quality never changes. Effa as a quality always remains the same. The scholars of Akhla, they say, Arfa is the balanced position 
of the faculty for uh, appetites. al Because we have different faculties for the soul. We have al qawwatul al al-qawwatul shahawiyya, al qawwatul ghadabiyya. Each of them has its extremes and its balanced position. For al qawwatul al which is responsible for thinking, the balanced position is wisdom or hikmah. For al qawwatul ghadabiyya, the faculty for anger, the balanced position is bravery, is shaja'a. And al qawwatul shahawiyya, the balanced position is al iffah chastity and modesty. If you go to extreme from any side, either by exercising too much the faculty of for apartheid or too little, then it's not ethical. The balance position is F, and F is always good. There is no difference between modern society or traditional society, East, West. Effa is always good as a quality. To have control over your emotions, over desires, etc. In a balanced way. But then there are actions which express which exhibit which demonstrate that quality in the soul what a modest man or woman a man who is afif or a woman who is afifa what a modest man or woman do to demonstrate or what naturally comes out of that quality can sometimes be different. But the quality has to be there. The quality has to be there. So it's not that, for example, in all societies, all you know, times, all cultures. For women, for example, it's uh, bad to drive. Maybe in some societies it's bad to drive or bad to be a taxi driver or bus driver. Maybe for in some societies it's okay. But what is important is that effa should not be compromised. Modesty should not be compromised. But as a modest woman, is it bad to be a taxi driver? For example, a bus driver or not, that is something that can change. If people don't look at you, look at you in the bad way, or you know, you can keep your respect, your dignity, your honor, you observe your hijab. So you can try jobs that maybe in some cultures or in the past you could not have this job as a dignified woman. But now maybe it's different. But you cannot compromise about effa, about dignity, about certain rulings uh, that relate to relation with the opposite gender, etc. So actions are something, virtues, vices, or in general qualities of the soul are something else. There is a relation between them, certainly, but this is not always the same. Another example which I normally use is truthfulness. Ayatollah Mutahari also refers to this example. Um, and he mentions the story from Saadi, inshallah, I will mention that. I normally use this example. I say there are two things. One is Truthfulness as a quality, sadq as a quality. There are people who are sadiq, o sadiq, o sadiqa. Quran says, Ittaqullah wa kunu ma'as sadiqin. Have 
God wariness and be with those who are truthful. Or we have Siddiqa wa Ummu Siddiqa. Lady Mary was Siddiqa. Or Vazkur fil Kitab Ibrahim in Naukan and Nabi and Siddiqa. Ibrahim was Siddiq, was most truthful. So when we say someone is Sadiq or Siddiq, it's not about telling the truth only. It's a quality. If someone in words, in actions, in intentions, in general orientations of life is committed to the truth, this person is truthful. If a person doesn't observe the truth, in heart, in intention, in beliefs, is not following the truth, but maybe accidentally he says some true words. This doesn't make this person a truthful person. It doesn't make him sadiq. Yes, the words are sadiq. The statements can be sadiq, can be true. But the person may not be truthful. Sometimes even people may be hypocrite. They say something which is true, but they don't believe in this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Munafiqeen, when they come to the Prophet, they say, we bear witness that you are the messenger of Allah. This is a true statement. Yes, he is Rasulullah. But Allah says that he knows that he, you are his Rasul, but he, Allah bears witness that they are kazib, they are liars. They said something right. They said in Nakala Rasul. But they are kazib. Because what they said was not accepted by themselves, was not believed by themselves. Therefore, our ulama say, you know, sometimes we have said as a quality of the statement. Sometimes said is a quality of the person. When Quran says, Kunu or talks about those who are Siddiq. Man yuta'illah wa rasoolahu fa'ulaka ma'al ladheena an'ama allahu alayhim min al-nabiyin wa shuhada wa siddiqin wa salikhin wa hasuna ulaka rafiqa. Who are these Siddiqin? The people who have quality of sadr in them, not just telling the truth. Telling the truth is important. But as I said, sometimes even a liar can tell the truth. So we have to distinguish between two things. A virtue or vice and actions which originate from them or demonstrate them. Truthfulness as a quality. This is very important for the discussion about relativism. Truthfulness as a quality has no exception. No exception at all. Is there any time, any place, any circumstances where you should not be truthful? No. Or any circumstances that it's okay not to be truthful? No. There is no circumstance, no situation where you should not or you are okay not to be truthful. No. Always. You have to be truthful. But saying the true things as action can have exceptions. Sometimes we should not tell the true things. 
for example, it's a private issue of your patient. You are a doctor. You cannot tell, even if it is true, what conditions your patient has to others. You cannot say, I am telling the truth. No, telling truth as action has to be regulated. Sometimes you can tell the truth. Sometimes you cannot tell the truth. You are a solicitor. You are an accountant. You have to keep information about your clients confidential. You cannot say this to others and say, this is true. Okay? Or, for example, if someone innocent is in danger and the one who wants to you know, harm him or kill him is asking you, where is this place, a person hiding, for example? You cannot endanger an innocent life by telling the truth. So you see, truthfulness as a quality has no exception. Even one minute of your life, you cannot ignore truthfulness as a quality. Always you have to be truthful. But when it comes to actions, then sometimes to tell the truth cannot be acceptable. Ethically, is not acceptable. Most of the time it's acceptable. Most of the time it's a necessity. But something can come and override. If you want to explain this more technically, I'm expanding here and using what the late Sheikh Muhammad Rida Mudaffar mentions in his book, Usul al Fiqh which is one of the great books on Usul of the intermediate level in the Sotu, how is they study? He says, sometimes the relation between an action and moral judgment is necessary. There is a necessary kind of relation because it, there is complete cause there is a lot of time for example adl justice is always good zol injustice is always bad because adl and justice by themselves are complete causes or goodness or badness. But sometimes there is no illatitame. There is no complete cause. There is incomplete cause. There is ikhtada. Means they are leading to something. There is a tendency. There is entitlement. But it can be overridden. Like telling the truth or telling a lie. This is not for goodness or badness. This is means if there is nothing else, telling truth is good. If there's nothing else, telling lie is bad. But if something stronger overrides, then can change the judgment. For example, Telling truth when endangers an innocent life, then it's no longer good. It's like fire is muqtazi, is incomplete cause for what? For burning. But maybe something comes and doesn't let fire burn. Fire is not a lot of time. Like the case of Ibrahim, fire didn't burn. Or even in ordinary cases, if you have a fireproof clothes, would not burn you. If there is no, uh, you know, 
oxygen cannot you know burn or if for example um, something is you know wet or you know frozen fire cannot you know burn at least cannot burn quickly so it's not that whenever we, fire exists it burns it's mortal if there is no money no obstacle yes so some titles some anawin as we call them they are complete causes for moral goodness or badness some are muqtadi means if they are left to themselves nothing else is there everything being equal they have certain judgment but it can be overridden and there is a third group which are neutral like walking talking eating drinking are these morally good or bad they can be sometimes good they can be sometimes bad are they like adl and zulm no certain are they like telling truth and telling lie no because telling lie or telling a truth in itself has some ekteza, some entitlement but talking in itself is neutral depending on what title later belongs to it it takes a moral judgment for example you talk to make someone who is sad happy then this is good one of the reasons that talking can be good is you want to make a person happy but sometimes for example you are annoying someone with your talk then this becomes bad so it's neutral some people who are not very educated in uh, ethics when they look at these different senses they oh there is relativity telling truth sometimes is good sometimes is bad talking is sometimes good sometimes bad you know walking eating drinking so they think there is no universal value but the reality is that this has nothing to do with relativism because relativism is about virtues and vices and values in themselves we believe that truthfulness is always good but what you have to do in action in practice that's different that can be very much changeable like for example you know to make it more simple for example this person wants to marry to another person okay before the marriage formula is recited they are strangers this man and woman are strangers they cannot shake hand they are going to marry but still khutbatun nikah and then siqatun uh, nikah well, khutbah is not necessary but siqatun nikah the formula for marriage is not recited so they are strangers they cannot shake hand after it is recited they can shake hand is this relativity you say oh it has changed they were not you know able to shake hand now they are able to shake hand we say this has nothing to do with relativity they are the same people but anawin titles change i cannot use this car because it belongs to someone else it's ethically wrong for me to use this car without permission of the owner then later i get the permission or i buy it i can use it this is not relativity this is change of title change of circumstances relativity is that values change you say a slavery is right and then you say a slavery is wrong 
And then you say both of them are right. Those who say slavery is right and those who say slavery is wrong, you say both of them are right. This is relativity. If you say slavery has always been bad and some people did it, but they shouldn't, this is not relativity. If people hold on different views, this is not relativity because they may have different views, but some of them can be wrong. Just because people differ, as we said you know, in the discussion, because people differ doesn't mean there is no single true morality or there are no universal moralities. Differences of opinions is not a proof for relativism. Differences of judgments when circumstances have changed also doesn't necessarily mean there is relativism. Relativism is that people at the same time, in the same circumstances are qualified, justified to have conflicting opinions and be equally true or equally justified. This is relativism. So this is about a very important point about difference between qualities and actions. Uh, Ayatollah Mutahari uh, mentions something about uh, Saadi. You know, Saadi has two famous collections of poems. One is Gulistan, one is Bustan. And he says that uh, in India, uh, Gulistan of Saadi was very popular before the uh, Farsi, you know, was replaced with English, etc. And he says, at some point, they tried to uh, stop circulation of Gulistan. And they said there is something in uh, Gulistan, maybe as an example, I don't know, just they focus on this, that they said we cannot accept, this is not moral. What was that? That was a poem by Saadi, which he was saying that uh, if you tell lie for great maslaha, great interest, it is better than telling the truth and cause mafsada. Okay? So, so sometimes you have duroog maslahati. So it has to be defined, of course. What type of masla? Not that, you know, because you want to make, you know, one dollar more, you need to lie. But when something very serious is at risk, like saving life of people, like reconciliation, husband and wife are, you know, in bad relation, father and child, for example. Sometimes you have no choice other than telling a lie to improve the relation. Because relation between people is so important that if the only way, if the only way is to tell a lie, you know, your husband loves you, you know, I know uh, he loves you. You go to the wife, you say this to go to husband say you know your wife in love etc you try to find uh, a way to bring them back to reconcile is so important that a faqih a jurist may allow to save a marriage with telling a lie this is duruga maslahatamis Saadi says such lie is better than telling a truth that, for example, divides people. You 
imagine someone has heard something from someone and says and the same thing which is true to the other party and then causes separation, division, hatred. So this says that lie which was to reconcile, for example, is better than this truth which is said but is divisive. His idea is right and no one can deny this. Of course, he said it, you know, not in an ethical or you know, moral philosophical book, but the idea was there. But some people said, no, this is unethical and, you know, we should stop circulation of Gulistan. And Ayatollah Mutahari quotes one of the scholars, you know, the late Mohita Tabatabai, that the reason was not this. They were not happy with other ideas of Kulistan and they try, try to stop Kulistan Asadi. In any case, sometimes an action can have different rulings, different moral positions based on the circumstances, but it's about actions, not about the qualities. The other point that he makes also is very important. He says, those who teach akhlaq, those who promote akhlaq, or in his words, tabligh akhlaq, they want to you know, propagate, they want to preach akhlaq, they should do two things, among other things. One is that when it comes to the qualities, they should categorically they should you know definitely promote quality, good qualities virtues like f shaja hikma etc chastity bravery wisdom kindness justice trustworthiness etc when it comes to qualities but when it comes to the actions they should inform people that actions can change. They should not take certain actions as sacred forever or certain actions as taboo forever. They need to ask qualified scholars to explain for them. Unfortunately, sometimes even scholars themselves you know, suffer from this problem. He says, as an example, he says, when I was in Qom in the early years of his study in Qom, because he had started his study in other places, and then he moved to Qom, he says, I heard that uh, some people in Japan, they needed a mubalik, a preacher, and the late Ayatollah had Sheikh Abdul Karim Ha'iri. We call him Muasses because Jose El Qum has long history, both to the time of Ahlul Bayt. But there was a time that it was in decline. Had Sheikh Abdul Karim Ha'iri, Ridwanullah Ta'ala, refounded, not that founded for the first time. But refounded, reestablished, revived the Hobza. They we call him Muasses. And he was a, one of the teachers of Imam Khomeini. So Ayatullah Sheikh Abdul Karim Hairi wanted to send a Talab, an educated Talab scholar, to Japan at that time to help people who wanted to know more about Islam. And they needed a guide and, you know. So they asked someone, Ava and maybe his, you know, office, etc. He wanted to send someone. And he said, I cannot go. He refused. Why? He said, I am worried that if I die there, I will be buried in a cemetery that might not be you know, for Muslims or 
even if Muslims are there, you know, to be buried in that place, I don't want. I want to be buried in Qom, for example, or Mashhad or Najaf. So he didn't go. And some people went from Al Azhar. And Ayatollah Mutahari says, as a result, about 20,000 people uh, became Muslims, but this person lost the opportunity to introduce the school of Ahlul Bayt to them. Why? Because he wanted not to be buried there. This is the problem, that sometimes we take something which is important in itself, very important in itself, but it's not sacred, it's not necessary. We prioritize it over things which are more fundamental and more necessary. And there are lots of examples, and some of the examples, if you mention, you know, people get upset, you know. This is why we always need guidance from enlightened scholars, not even every scholar, not even everyone who has imama. Even sometimes people who have imama or you know, have studied, they are not that wise. We need wise scholars. We need our maraj to help us with making decisions. You cannot keep certain practices forever and think these are sacred. You have purposes, you have principles, you have values. They are the most important ones. Any practice should always be checked whether they are serving the purpose or not. It's not at all the time. Even some of the most important things for us, maybe at some point, we may need to revise them, we need to check them, we may need to um, have upgrade transformation, etc. Anyway, this is also something that he says anyone who is working in educating people about Akhla, they should consider these things. He talks about the example of Abu Dhar. Abu Dhar, you know, was very frank very truthful person. Uh, even when in uh, Laylatul Mabit, Abu Zar was uh, carrying the Prophet. So some people asked the pagans, what are you carrying? Because he had covered uh, the Prophet and maybe was uh, you know, carrying on his back. He said, Muhammad, or something like this, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi The pagan said <laughs> he must not tell the truth. You know, if he was carrying Prophet Muhammad, he would not say because they were after, after the Prophet, they wanted to kill him. So they didn't take it seriously and he went. So Ayatollah Mutahari says, if Abu Zar, did not know that they would disregard this and he was going to endanger life of the prophet he should not have told the truth you never you know take risk about the life of the prophet so no one should say because abu zar even in that time told the truth, we should always tell the truth. No, Abu Zar told the truth knowing that they are not going to accept. But if Abu Zar knew or even there was serious possibility, probability that they would take it seriously and check and find out the prophet and then kill the prophet, Abu Dhar had no right to say that he was carrying the prophet. So you have to be truthful all the time, but whether you should tell true statements, it depends. Generally speaking, yes. 
But sometimes something much bigger can be at risk, like innocent lives. Then you cannot keep saying, no, I tell the truth, no matter what is the case. This is a stubbornness. This is not truthfulness. Okay, I think we stop here and we inshallah can continue Allah, next session, inshallah, in two weeks. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Jazakallah. May Allah bless you, inshallah. Question. Hello, about the wise person you mentioned during the lecture. So, how do we come to know the person is wise? Is, like, is there any quality we have to check and we can identify or? If you are interested uh, in knowing more about wisdom, I have two series. One understanding wisdom, one on practical wisdom. So you can see the signs, requirements of wisdom. But briefly, it's very difficult for unwise people to find out who is wise. Actually, many times unwise people have difficulty with wise people. Yeah. Only if you have at least this level of wisdom that you don't expect wise people to think like you. <laughs> if you have at least this little wisdom, that's great. Unfortunately, there are people that as soon as they see someone disagrees with them, even has much more studies, much more experience. They label them, they attack them, they did, or at least they boycott them. So this is a problem that we want wise people to be like us. So we have to have openness. One of the things that helps is to see the credentials. You, you can buy something very good, brand new, yeah, like brand new computer, brand new car, brand new mobile. But brand new leaders, brand new scholars are risky. It's not that they are faulty, but you cannot establish their wisdom. Someone who has just graduated or someone who has, you know, studied, we need to see how they have worked. We need to see what success records they have, how they have behaved in different circumstances with different groups of people. These are some signs for wisdom. If you see someone has good success records, has been able to establish something here and there, you know, be in good relation with people. This could be a sign of wisdom, but someone who has no experience, who is just speaking nicely, we don't know he's wise or not. Sometime, someone who has not uh, wide experiences, someone who has no, you know, diverse teachers, diverse, you know, life uh, circumstances. It's very difficult to be wise. Wisdom needs piety, sincerity, but also needs information, teachers, experiences, travels, lots of things need to be together so that we could have then a wise person, a wise guide. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Lali Fatma. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Lali Fatma. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Thank you. With your dua, Alhamdulillah. I have a couple of questions, both related to speaking the truth. Yes. You know that when there is a greater maslaha, yeah. you can either lie or do toriya. Yeah. 
And some people somehow get into the habit of doing Tauriya for everything, little or small, just mm. to keep the things secret. But does that not have any spiritual effects on our souls? Because we are constantly trying to kind of, trying some sort of a subterfuge, I think, unless it is necessary. And the second question is that when we see the maslaha in speaking the truth and then start speaking the truth, then there might be two sides to it. So or say in a marriage proposal or something, say, so we know that this person is not good and someone comes and asks us, so whose maslaha should we, or in a business proposal, someone has cheated us already and we know that. So should we disclose it or just leave it thinking that maybe this person has improved or somehow caution the other party? Yeah, very good questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy that you asked this question because I was wanted to talk about Toria. So Toria means we say something which can be understood in more than one ways, for example, two ways. What is more likely to be understood is not what you meant. So that person take it in that way, but you meant it in another way. So this is not a lie. And they say, if there are cases that you need to tell lie, for example, to save an innocent life, some say if it is possible, do toria. Like for example, you know, someone asks you, where is this person? I want to find him and kill him, for example. You may go one step further, as we have about Amir Rumi, and say, as long as I am here, I haven't seen him. You didn't tell lie because you mean by here, the new place. You have gone one step, you know, uh, to write, for example. He, he thinks you mean here, this area, this location. So this is called Toria. Toria in itself may not be a lie and may not be a haram. You, of course. These are practical issues. Even here, you have to check your marajah about lying, ghayb, backbiting, etc. But they may generally say it's not a, a, a lie, it's not haram. But it's very close to telling a lie. And therefore, you should not get used to do this. If this is for saving innocent life, is for cases where... Uh, truth should not be said, that's different. But if all the time husband and wife, for example, or children with their parents, they do toria, they do things that they don't want, but they try to, you know, misguide them, misinform them in this way without telling lies, this is not acceptable. Why? Because as I said, if you are a truthful person, you would hate lies. You know, this is a very important point. A truthful person, even if has to tell a lie, he hates this. It's very difficult for him. So why I have to say this? Although I want to save, you know, someone's life or I want to reconcile, but it feels very bad. It's like Akilol Mita. For example, someone is starving to death and there is only, for example, haram meat. We say for esterar to save your life, you can eat just as much as is needed, even if it is not halal. Just to save your life, it's permissible. But you don't enjoy them. It's not that you enjoy eating that haram, for example, meat or haram food. Yeah, you dislike, even you dislike yourself, but you say, I have to save my life. So for a truthful person, telling lie, even when it is legally permissible, is very difficult, very bitter. But if you keep doing Torah 
and you don't feel bad about it. So this means that you have problem. You are not an honest person. You are not a truthful person. You, this has become ordinary for you. You are just trying not to tell lies which are haram. But you have not become a truthful person. You know, some, Because unfortunately, many times, we just operate at the level of actions. Bring wajibat, avoid haram. This is not enough. This is the beginning, but we have to reach the point that we develop qualities which lead to good actions naturally. Even if there is no questioning. If suppose Allah says to us that I'm not going to punish you for your haram actions. Are we still going to do qiba? Say because not going to punish, I do qiba. Or we have to reach the point that we hate qiba and backbiting. Whether it's punished or not shouldn't make difference. Why we, for example, you know, clean our body? Why we wash our clothes? Is it because, for example, it's wajib to look after our health? Or because we love cleanliness? We have to reach the point that we love good actions, we dislike bad actions, and naturally do them. But if someone is doing toria and you know all the time, and just making sure that doesn't get into haram ones, it means that quality of honesty and truthfulness are not there, and at least has not grown. So they have to be careful. The second question about when you are consulted, someone wants to marry or do business with someone and ask you, and you have already bad experience about this person. So one of the cases that ulama normally maraja uqaha permit based on the hadith, but of course you check your own marja. But normally, generally speaking, they say it's in the time of mashwara. If someone wants to marry and ask you, you need to be honest. But first of all, it should be facts. You should not say, you know, I think he's not a good person. You don't have fact, you think, no. It should be based on the facts. And secondly, you have to disclose that much which is necessary. It's not that you say everything. For example, if that person needs one reason not to marry this person, and you know that reason is there, you don't need to then mention five reasons. Or for example, there is something about him, and there is something about other members of the family. You have to be careful what to share and how much to share. Uh, this is what we need guidance then from our maraj. But generally speaking, we should not let someone's life become miserable by depriving them of what we know, especially when they consult you. You know, sometimes you know but you, you are not sure whether you should say to them or not. They didn't ask you, but you know. Even here, sometimes you may need to sell. But if they ask you for advice, then you have to be honest. Hadith says, man fi mashwaratan aw mashuratan. If someone in mashura, in mashwara, in consultation, is not honest and doesn't say the truth or say bad things is not one of us. But how much to say? Of course, we need to ask for guidance. Uh, the main thing is you don't enjoy, again here, disclosing problems of people. You hate this, but you force yourself because you think this is your Islamic duty to mention, and you have evidence that this is your duty. Uh, 
So this is a good test that when you lose this sensitivity and you you know get indifferent or even nausebullah, you enjoy, then that's the problem. You know, for example, some people unfortunately, when it comes to politics, you know, they think there is no regulations about riba. You know, they are public people, public figures, politicians. I don't know, we can do riba, whatever. Many times they do tohma. But even riba, who said you can do this with any public figure? Is it about their public statements or is it about private life? And also you enjoy this or you are hating yourself because sometimes they enjoy and they say, you know, we have no excuses to, you know, disclose. So a mu'min would never take risk about these issues. And even if it's 100% proof that here it's okay, you should do it with deep sense of bitterness. It's like a poison that you are taking. It's really a poison. But if you see that, no, you are or, or, or normal, okay, even you enjoy, so you have to worry. Seriously worry. Thank you, Sheikh. That was very useful. Can I yes. ask one more follow-up question? Yes. To this? It's more sensitive than this. But say if you know an Imam Jamaat and you knew they were not Adil in the past, and now you suspect they might not be Adil still, but they are leading the namaz. Uh, should you be following it? And should you know for sure that they are not Adil? Should you also be telling the other people that they shouldn't be following this Imam? So, so in the past, this person was not Adil, but not Adil. maybe. But now maybe. you suspect that they might not be, they might have changed. Yeah. So. If you have not established that this person is Adil and you know, I mean, I've not changed, for yourself is a problem. Mm -hmm. But you don't need to tell other people. Okay. Uh, it's different from, uh, for example, you know, other cases. Imam al Jama'a, if people think that he is Adil and they say prayer behind this person, their salat is okay, even if he's not Adil. If people had evidence or Hosna Zahir, if some Maraja Allah Hosna Zahir, their salat is okay. Even uh, Imam Khomeini says if an Imam of Jama'ah doesn't think he's Adil, yeah, sometimes people are aware they are not Adil or they are very <clears throat> careful and, you know, they humble. They say, I'm not Adil. For example, one of our great scholars was very, very pious, uh, Ayatollah Madani. He was a Friday prayer leader of Tabriz and, and a president of Imam. He was very, very pious and he was assassinated. But when he was starting Salatul Jum'ah, making a niya and saying Takbiratul Ram was taking him long. To the extent that, you know, some people inquired, you know, why? And Allah was saying that I am thinking whether I am Adil or not. Because for Salatul Jama'ah, uh, Imam, if it's not Adil, but people think he's Adil, it's okay. But for Salatul Jum'ah, Imam must know that he's Adil. Mm -hmm. So he was saying, I'm not sure I am Adil or not. I'm checking myself every time, you know, am I Adil or not? So sometimes people are that humble that they are not sure they are Adil or not. But for Salat or Jama'ah, if people say, no, you are Adil, we believe you are Adil, they can say prayer behind you. Or if they don't know, they have Hujjah that he's Adil, but they don't know some of the things. Their Salat is okay. So you don't need to tell them. But for yourself, if the previous condition was established to be not Adil, then you need to establish the opposite. Uh, but <coughs> what you can do, you can, you know, say your salat there and then repeat it at home, for example, if you don't want to be appearing as 
you know, critical of that person causing division, etc. Because you are not sure also. And sometimes even if you are sure, but for the sake of community, if everything is all right, I am the only person that knows, you know, so sometimes you have to be there, but you, but sometimes your presence can become a confirmation. That's another thing. So for example, you are a scholar, you are a leader, for example, attending this Salat, and you know this person not qualified, then you have different responsibility. Sometimes you are an ordinary person. No one you know, would say this person is Adel or qualified because this person is attending the Amah. So there are different cases and you have to measure what uh, is the significance of your attendance or not attendance. Thank you, Sheikh. Thank you very much. Jazakumullah khair. Yes, Sister Nassim Fatma, please mention yes, your speaking. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Alaykum calling from New York. And my question, you know, if, if I know someone is like, uh, they are having, they are going to get married, and I'm sure of that person that he's not good, but they did not ask me. So do I have to tell them that you be careful? And I know for sure about this person, be careful, you can get into trouble. If you are sure, you can signal something that, you know, I have concern, you know, please double check, please do more inquiries. Uh, if this is not enough and you are sure that this person is going to be, you know, suffering and you know maybe it leads to divorce soon then you may even need to share a little bit but you should ask your marja or the office of your marja it's it's not easy to ask a marja you know for these little little things or the offices okay. or alhamdulillah they have offices they have even but, on the website they answer but the answer uh, after such a long time, and maybe that person but got married. This much, this much, I don't think this they exactly anyone that at least raise question, raise a doubt. In doubt saying, in them, okay. Yes, this much, if you are sure, raise doubt. Oh, okay, okay. Jazakallah. Jazakumullah. May Allah bless you. Thank you. Yeah, sister Sayyida. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, Aga, my question is a little bit, um, but I think that's something uh, important because uh, my question is like, spiritually, we all are supposed to be having this, uh, I will say, I will say like destination that we have to discover spiritually that God is only powerful force within us, around us, all over the universe. Spiritually this, is, spiritually, this is the finding every human being, every human soul should discover. But physically, according to the division of labors on the earth, we have to find out that task we were supposed, to, we were made for. For example, Hazrat Fatima to Zahra, as she prays from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, that please make me free for the task I am made for. So. Is it that when we ask for the marifat in nafs, like how are you going to relate this this marifat in nafs with these two points? Like, okay, we know that Allah Pak is in control of all the events all the time, and then we have to discover that that the journey on our own. That in this world, what are those tasks we are made for? And is this, is this what Marfit is going to take us along? Like, what are what is that role we are supposed to be playing? Like, uh, I hope you got my point. Yeah. So this is my question. Like, I think that becomes a very root of a human existence because uh, sometimes all of our dealings are somehow dependent on this very question that what I am, why, why I'm here, what, what I'm supposed to do exactly. Uh, you know, so yeah, this is my question. Thank you. Of course, the power belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah has 
given also part of that power to us, especially for what is making us good or bad, we have power. Yeah, I cannot change many things, but the decision to be a good person or bad person is on me. Okay, this much control every person has. So for cashing, for you know, using this power, again, we ask Allah for help because it needs guidance, it needs wisdom, it needs courage, it needs also uh, having less interferences of other people at least to make it easier. So we make our journey and we are responsible for it, but all the time we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help, for guidance. And therefore, in this way, we are connected and widening our connection with the source. If I disconnect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I may have some power to continue, but then I go and run out of charge. Yeah. So people who disconnect from Allah, Allah has given them some power. In, there is some power inside them. But then after some time, they run out of charge. They don't understand then anything else. All the system <laughs> shuts down. So we have some power. But we need to be connected so that we receive more, we are recharged, and we can continue our journey. Thank you, Allah. Yeah, Allah bless you. Can we conclude the session? Yes, Sayyidah, you yes, want to? Inshallah, we can finish, yes. So maybe can we can you... finish, inshallah, with Dua'i Faraj. Yeah, please, sir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك علي وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه وربك توعا وتمتعه فيها طبيلا اللهم ارحم موتانا اللهم اشف مرضانا اللهم اقض حوائجنا اللهم ادعنا الدين واغننا من الفقر 